Content warning. The following video contains material that may be harmful or traumatizing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 7. Zenith. And here we are at the final world. I don't like to discuss this part, and it still bothers me very much, but it's something I have to do so that I can put this behind me. People deserve to know. At this point, I was well aware of the game's unnatural nature, but Zenith was different than the other worlds. While the others were certainly strange and sometimes frightening, the world of Zenith was like a nightmare. And I didn't have to go any further than the board screen for an indication that something was wrong with Zenith. The first thing that I noticed was the blood red texture of the board and the music, which was an eerie whistling tune. I noticed that I had Solomon and Angiris back, and I felt better for a second. Then I scrolled over to the right to see who my next enemies would be this time. This time, it was Destroya and Ghidorah, Ghidorah. But judging from the icon, it was a different Ghidorah than the original, standing on the ground instead of flying. The grotesquely detailed pinkish red icon also caught my eye. I could tell what it was supposed to be, and I was afraid to find out. Going back to my side of the board, I decided that there wasn't much of a choice but to do my usual routine and going to the quiz level before doing anything else. I was not ready for what happened. I jumped back when this first appeared, accompanied by a terribly distorted vision of the password theme. It looked as if his face had fallen victim to some terrible glitch. Is this what he meant? But will you miss me? Did he know this would happen? My thoughts were stopped short when I noticed the screen was glitching and seeming to fall apart while I was inactive. So I quickly rushed out. <sighs> and when I got back to the board, it, I somehow had a new monster. I, I hadn't even been asked if I wanted one. I, I tried to select it. And this happened. No. What the hell is going on? The game's behavior was scaring me. And I hadn't even started the levels yet. I, I couldn't understand why I was randomly given a new character, and, but then denied use of it. But for the time being, there was little that could be done. And I viewed the last TV screen. No animation. No music. Just dead. Every instinct I had was telling me to stop playing. To just turn the game off. And something in the game itself might have been trying to warn me as to just how horrible this last world was. But, but then every stretch of the way, 
I was compelled to give up. I, I couldn't do that now on the last world. Besides, after taunting me with memories of Melissa, I felt this game owed me some answers. I noticed that the first level was a red temple. So at least I would be familiar with the level graphics, if nothing else. And I went in with Godzilla, the monster I'm most familiar with. Godzilla had been shrunk. The level and score meters had vanished. And the blue temple faces were back. The music was similar to the Blue Temple also. Strange, haunting vocalization. I tried to get my spirits up by thinking, well, if this level is like the Blue Level, Blue Temple, then it might mean there are no monsters to deal with. How wrong I was. After a short walk, all the statue eyes started glowing, and a pack of the beasts from Shadow Labyrinth came charging at me. Since they were coming from the right side of the screen, I had to fight my way through them. The battle greatly tested my reflexes, but thanks to my speed, I plowed through the beasts. They gave off health power-ups after dying, which helped recover the damage they had given me. However, as I continued through the hallway, the statue's eyes glowed again, summoning another wave. It seemed to be the same number of them, but I was less prepared this time and took more damage. I had gone through four of these waves until I reached the end of the hall where I heat-beamed the last of the monsters over the edge of the abyss. At first, it seemed as though I'd reached a dead end, but after the statue's eyes stopped glowing, a brick path appeared before me. I followed the path, which kept me moving towards the right until it stopped at a wall. Where I was to go vertically by jumping up ledges. Along the way, I had encountered new creatures and some sort of strange shrine. Which I had a statue of the Hell Beast and some other creature I didn't recognize. As I went through, the path took a downward direction. I had to carefully aim my jumps to avoid the enemies. Which were plentiful in this part of the stage. They didn't have many attacks, but they could easily shove you over the plat off the edge of the platform. At the end of this tunnel, there were a few small platforms floating above nothingness. I landed on one towards the left of the screen. And then something came down from above. It looked like the blue angel from the graveyard, except now it was red, had a skull face. Any of the pleasant feelings I had from the blue angel were not present with this red one. And as it hovered around, its eye sockets started glowing just like the statue, summoning monsters to attack me. Surely this was not the benevolent thing I encountered before. This must be some kind of imposter. The battle was nerve-wracking. And I started off with nearly half my health and 
had to go deal with multiple opponents as well as the threat of gravity. To make things worse, as the Red Angel took damage, some of the panels fell until only three remained. But my luck had not ran out yet. Just when I thought it was over, I struck the angel, Red Angel one more time, and it turned out one last hit was all it could take. Just as the Red Angel completely disintegrated, the game instantly went back to the Zenith board. I moved Mothra over to the nearest stage from the Red Temple, which seemed to be a garbled mess of the letters spelling KILL and began playing. As suspected, all of the level graphics were made of jumbled letters, and Mothra, just like Godzilla, were shrunk to half size. I began to suspect that all of the Zenith levels would be like this. The background music was terrible, as if someone put all the sounds the NES and NES was capable of making into a blender and then piecing them back together into a song. I had to turn the volume down because of it. Playing as Mothra made avoiding the enemies easier, but they were nonetheless determined to get at me. The first enemies were I saw were headless guy games. And later on, there were hybrid monsters pieced together from previous bosses, like the bio-anti-headed thing seen above. Five minutes had gone by. I didn't see anything new. And the level shifted into another segment. The music changed from the loud and annoying beeps into something far more ambient and menacing. The level graphics also changed, now looking like a blood drenched junkyard. The way everything in this level was red made it sickening to look at. The enemy is multiplied in number never ceasing to follow after me. It became harder and harder to avoid. And at the end of the level, the situation reached a climax. As swarms of the monsters fused into one enormous, terrifying hybrid. Once I had gotten through the initial so shock, I discovered the way of to destroy this thing, constantly shooting eye beams at the Hedora cluster that formed its heads. If you attacked anywhere else, it would regenerate the damage. Even with that knowledge, this was an extremely difficult fight. I'd say it was as hard as fighting the Moon Beast was, if not harder. Its most common attack was lunging forward with its arms covered in Gigant saws and blades, and if they touched, they would instantly drain health. When it was over, the remaining monsters collapsed in a heap. Then they got on the ground and then they and the ground below them started to disintegrate and sink towards the bottom of the screen. When I came back to the board, I thought to myself, so far the game's been putting the easiest levels first. If this is the case, how bad will the rest of Zenith be? Two levels down and three to go. My monster is and I had taken our foothold in the world of nightmares that was Zenith. Just by what action to take next, deciding what action to take next was more tense and difficult than before. But ultimately, I had no way of 
knowing what the next levels would be like or how well my monsters would be prepared for them. So my only opinion was to guess. I tried to interpret what the icons of the next level was ahead of me were. The last level before the boss battles was obviously representing some type of volcano, volcanic area with lava and open flames. The middle icon I still didn't get except that it looked fleshy and vaguely organ, like an organ of some kind, oddly oversized as well. As well. The one I was nearest to and about the to enter next looked like thorny vines covered in covering in a puddle of blood. I guess this would be the one with blood rivers that, like the chase level in dementia. As such, I went down there with I went with Angiris because due to his rolling move, he would have the fastest speed while submerged. This level, which I call Blood Lake, looked as I expected. Rivers of blood accompanied by thorn-covered vines, which scattered all along the sides of the ground. The music was rather faint, but I could hear a distinct drum beat underwater. Oh, and a few other, uh, I can hear a distinctive drum beat and a few other instruments, a lot of echoes, and sometimes it sounded like someone was hitting a drum underwater. I was disappointed to see that Angiris had shrunk just as Godzilla and Mothra had, and apparently the zenith levels, apparently all the zenith levels, zenith levels would be like this. I felt less secure with my giant monsters no longer so giant. I walked along without uh, interruption for only a minute until my path reached a dead end. There was a massive gap between the ground I was walking on and the ground to the right side of the screen. I would have swam across and I, uh, I would have continued walking to the right by the huge mass of brambles in the way there was nowhere to go. Two creatures with gliding membranes on their arms and lamprey-like mouths were perched on the outstretched vines and screeching at me, much like a crow does to an invader of its territory. Another unnerving display, possible sentience by these creatures of the game, if, if it's even accurate to refer, to refer them as being part of the game, that is. I descended into the blood, slowly sinking to the floor. Aquatic animals were everywhere, and they were hard to avoid. The black shark in particular was very aggressive and hard to deal with, but thankfully I only encountered it once. As the screen became more and more crowded, I swam up to the surface to find what was littered, find that it was littered with floating corpses. Creepy, but at least that's not a threat. Or so I thought. Until they sprang out to life and leaped on me. They were trying to pull me under and they were draining my health as they did it. They all attacked as a group, and when I got one off of me, another one would jump on me from behind. I had to curl up into a ball and roll for them to get loose, to loosen their grip. And when they did, I qu quickly retreated. It wasn't long before I had reached another land path. 
I know regarding the brambles, you could stand on them, but it causes pain, and you also don't want to destroy some of the vines, but only the thinner ones. I destroy multiple vines as well as dealing with more enemies. I was interrupted by a screen. The screen was about, was up for about, oh, 30 seconds. Then it went back to the level. I was facing another dead end and a pregnant humanoid creature being hanged from the top right of the screen by a spinal umbilical cord. A niche instantly. The creature's belly was split open from the inside. And as the lower part of its body was ripped apart, and fell into the river below. The Blood Lake's boss was revealed. Came flying towards me, making a shrill, hacking scream. I was forced to move back. The bat was highly mobile boss. Fast and difficult to hit. As I moved back along the ground, the monster opened its mouth and shot out a barrage of, a barrage of needles. I jumped over them and managed to give it a blow to the head, and it started flying out of my reach. As the bat was flying, it shot a stream of fire from its eye sockets. I rolled on the ground, which drained my power, but put us at equal speed. This cycle repeated around three times until the monster was defeated. With most of my health drained, I went back to the edge of the level, and with a large bramble vine blocking the exit, was now gone. Now only two levels left to go. Who to send this time? Godzilla, Mothra, and Angiris had all completed one level, leaving Solomon. Also the mysterious fifth monster. I tried again to access it, but with no luck. I chose to use Godzilla again for the next level, and Solomon for the final one. The second to last level was what I referred to as the organic level. It was the most, which was the most physically, visually unpleasant of them all. Right from the start, I could see that the graphics were freakishly different. The atmosphere was so gruesome and foreboding. Right from the start, I could see the graphics were freakishly different. The atmosphere was gruesome and foreboding with the addition of the loud droning music. I was dreading what I would see in these levels, and it was only a few seconds before something appeared. Two hideous uh, things. It's hard to describe what m most of this level, even everything has a disturbing semi-real look to it. Most of the monsters look halfway between real monsters and misshapen lumps of gore with teeth. It's also worth noting that all of them were considerably larger than Godzilla, and all of the majority were not very intelligent. Each of them took around 30 plus hits to kill.
due to this, it was a better idea to run away from them than fight. But it was never clear exactly what the direction to run me to. To run and to run to. While most levels involve going to the right to get the access, the path of this level is primarily going down by walking to the edge of one platform and jumping down to a lower one. There was no way to make sure that you were going the right way, nor any apparent means of getting back up to the higher platform if necessary. There's no way to make sure you were getting back to the going the right way, nor, nor any apparent means of getting back up to higher platforms if necessary. Also, certain enemies acted as if they were aware you had to jump down and would stand at the edge of a lower platform waiting for you. When this happened, I would have to walk back and wait until the monster would leave. As I went on, I came across platforms stacked above each other with little space in between, looking like a maze. This meant that I couldn't jump, and it made escape from enemies difficult. Thankfully, the only enemies able to fit through these mazes were the four-legged beasts I had seen at the beginning of the level. Adding to the difficulty were long tapeworm-esque monsters that would rise themselves between the platforms and trap you. The only thing they responded to was the heat beam, which would cause them to shrink back down, but the, this was costing even more power. And I couldn't afford to do without the heat beam for long. While trying to avoid the abominations that dwell in this level, I found out that if you stand idle for one place for too long, the crown tries to absorb your monster. I think it was about four minutes before the end that this level is was making me physically sick. The tension was getting to me and having to take all taken all these disgusting sights made me want to puke. I nearly did pause the game and look for a bag, but I was able to hold it together. I found also a trick at the end of the level that it was too late for me to do and a real good. But if two different species of monster run into each other face to face, then they would fight each other and leave me alone. I didn't intentionally cause this, it just happened. Finally, at the end, it was time for another boss fight. It was certainly ugly, but not quite as horrific as I feared it would be. But more important than dealing with the appearance of defeating it, with, with its appearance was defeating it. And since I had less than half my bar to start with, there was no room for errors. It was attached to the floor when I first saw it, but after 10 fit hits, it detached to the floor and began floating. It moved fast, but unlike the Blood Lake's boss, it, he'll, he wasn't impeded by any sort of gravity. It was even able to fly through the ground without collision event. Without any collision effect. It used this to its advantage. It also would float between, uh, beneath the ground and the spring and spring up and randomly bite it to bite you. But it stopped doing this after a few well-aimed kicks to the face. The pink area on its upper jaws was a weak point too. Many hits would cause them to spasm uncontrollably. It 
the nuclear strategy was rapidly was to rapidly float up and down while moving back and forth across our age. Health was getting crucial at this point, and I spammed the heat wave, which from which it had no defense. And the last stretch of this battle, the monster rapidly rushing back and forth and gnashing its jaws. I had to duck under it and then strike when its back was turned. 20 more hits and it was destroyed. And it was on to one last level. I didn't hesitate. I selected Solomon and entered. Perhaps a little too fast. This last level was definitely the peak of disconnect between what the NAS was graphically capable of and what this game could create. The music also caught my attention. It was one of the only songs that appeared more than once. The, the horrible screeching from what the Hell Beast from when the Hell Beast appeared in the graveyard. And as soon as I started, the, there was already an enemy prepared to attack, a centaur wielding a whip, and it wasn't alone. When I started fighting, several more centaurs appeared. from both sides of the scream at the same time. It was too much to handle. Solomon's flight saved me from taking too much damage at the start of the level. The centaurs followed him, but seemed unable to be unable to jump. After escaping the centaurs, I noticed gaps in the ground. Yeah, after... While trying to avoid the jumping sword mouthed enemies, in mid flight, I got close to the surface of the lava, and a creature emerged and tried to grab me. But it didn't succeed, but I was startled. Careful maneuvering would be needed here to avoid instant death. As new enemies appeared, the level soon became very difficult. A lot of the trouble came from stocky red demons that t stood on top of tall, narrow mountains and spewed fire. I got them by waiting until their back was turned and then hitting them with a flying kip, which made them fall, fall off the lava. It was at this time that I noticed that I wasn't gaining any health from killing enemies. Not at all. The ground was... Not all the ground was stable. At one point, the ground was reduced to small chunks that slowly drifted towards the right. Some of them would sink to the lava upon repeating... upon uh, landing on them. And there was no way they could tell which ones would sink and which ones would not. Being close to the lava added the threat of the lava creatures, and this was very frustrating. I was also feeling hot, which made concentrating hard. If you ever had a heat rash, it felt similar to that. I had to periodically, audically stop for water because of it. This was almost certainly due to the game and not my imagination, but I kept pushing through the thought out of my head. I didn't want to think about it. At the end of the stage, I encountered the boss rising from the lava. Its arrival noted with a godly, unhowling roar. When it walked onto the land, I could saw how gigantic it was. Several times the size of Solomon. 
I was about to fly up and attack it when it opened its mouth and let out a huge blast of fire. I had to fly to dodge the flames and then get close enough to the boss to fire a heat beam at its face, causing it to stumble backward. If it didn't stumble backward, it would have kept moving left until it was forced Solomon into the lava and as there was no more guard within reach. The beast had to wait between uses of its fire breath, and it seemed to cost a great deal of energy. I used this time to attack it, but fire wasn't the only weapon, and I had to be wary of the monster swatting at me with its clawed hands. Its health decreased, it moved faster, and the battle felt like a tug of war between two monsters over the, this bridge of land. After about 40 hits, it was defeated, tumbling backwards into the lava from whence it came. And then the final stage had been completed. At last, it was down to two bosses and a final encounter with the Hell Beast. For some reason, I thought Ghidorah would be easier, so I confronted him first. The classic Ghidorah battle music from the original started up when I was faced with a new King Ghidorah. King Ghidorah was as powerful and unrelenting as ever. He instantly lashed out with gravity beams, which were damaging, more damaging than Godzilla's heat beam. It became a struggle of constantly beating Ghidorah at every opportunity to keep him from using the attack. Oh, Ghidorah saw soon that in my tactic, I started using physical attacks as well. He was striking with each of the necks, knocking me backward and making it impossible to get close enough to punch him, but I had an idea to wait for him to lung his way out and then heads out. Wait for him to lunge with one of the heads and immediately blast it with a heat beam. It worked and to my surprise the heat beam actually obliterated Ghidorah's middle head. It was only a few seconds before I realized what this led to and sure enough, King Ghidorah was using the power of the glitch to transform into Mecha King Ghidorah. But what really shocked me was the sudden change in music. I had heard it before, but it wasn't in the original NES game. It was from the game Super Godzilla during the Mecha King Ghidorah fight. Mecha King Ghidorah's first attack was its most deadly, the Machine Hand. Very similar to Gigan saw, it immobilizes the monster and rapidly drains its health, the health bar. Fortunately, before King Ghidorah could do a lot of damage, the timer ran out. I would need to defeat Mecha King God, uh, Ghidorah, Mecha King Ghidorah, quickly to prevent him from using the Mecha machine time. So I sent Solom uh, Solomon to fight him. The two monsters were infinitely matched in strength. With Ghidorah defeated, I returned to the baseball. I, retur I returned to the board. I now outnumbered the enemy by four monsters to one, and victory seemed soon at hand. The base icon had changed to a blood red color. I could feel hatred emanating from it. Started with the fight with Destroya and Angiris, and the music was the same as Ghidorah's. When the fight began, Destroya was in microscopic mode. After one hit, it changed to the Juvenile, which had few attacks 
I was also deadly with uh I was also dealt with easily. The fight became serious once Destroy entered his aggregate form, gaining the use of large arms and micro oxygen beam. Angiris's roll attack, which had been useful up till now, was rendered useless by Destroy constantly attacking me with his large arms when I tried to use it. For this part, I had to really rely on brute strength. Just before the time ran out, Destroy had changed to his flying form, which Angiris was ill suited to fight against. Going against him, I fought, going back in, and I fought the flying form with King Mothra before. Mothra was weaker than Angiris, but was much better equipped to dodge the encounter of flying Destroyer's attacks. So the fight was in my favor. However, the Mecha Ghidorah fight started playing, and Destroyer's changed to his final form sooner than I expected, which drastically turned the tables. Mothra's attacks were doing very little to destroy him. I had to move fiercely to avoid damage while waiting for the timer to run out. Even though it would be near impossible to beat Destroy with Mothra, I still had three other monsters. Final form of Destroy was very resilient to taking damage, and the heavily armored foe would not be so defeated without a long foe. Oh, without a long fight. In the last part of the fight, I wasn't using much strategy, just attacking as brutally and as fast as I could. On the last bar of health, Destroyer tried one last counterattack, a beam of energy from his chest. I don't know how powerful it would have been because just before it could fire, I punched Destroyer in the chest cavity, destroying him. And then that was it. The last Kaiju boss was gone. In the midst of all the excitement, I had briefly forgotten that there was still one last thing to do before the game was over. Seeing the icon again hit me like a ton of bricks, and I froze for a few minutes. I'd come so far to get this to this point, but I was terrified. I really did not want to know what this last encounter was going to be like before I could let myself think about it any longer. I moved Godzilla over and began the stage. You're here now. This is the end. Just one last thing and then it's all over. And when the screen changed, there was nothing. Just got to line a black screen. I walked back and forth, fired a heat beam. Nothing happened until I heard something. The faint sound of a familiar drumbeat. 